Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. Before today's episode begins, I wanted to go ahead and give a very special thank you, as well as a shout out to today's guest narrator, Miss Creepy Tales. She'll be joining us a little bit later on today. If you'd like to go ahead and hear some more scary stories, then check out her YouTube channel. It'll be pinned down below in the YouTube comments. Now with that said, sit back and relax as we get started with these scary stories on the Creepy Fox Podcast. Enjoy. Back in 2007 or so, we moved into a new house that had been off the rental market. That was due to the previous tenant trashing it. All good there, but there was still a blood stain on the carpet and holes in the walls, but they were fixing it up, and we were happy to find somewhere walking distance to everything. However, with that said, strange things kept happening. Underwear and bras were missing off the line. We kept seeing someone walking through our backyard. Someone moved a bench in the yard to under our son's bedroom door and tried to break the security screen. We padlocked the gates, but we kept seeing this person walking through, and then one night when my husband was away on a work trip, I could hear someone outside the house. They got to the fuse box, and there I am sitting in the dark with a two-year-old little boy with some maniac laughing and hitting the door. Needless to say, I called the police, but it took them six hours to arrive. They waved it off as a prank and they did very little. It really did shake my trust in the police. In three months, we had three attempted break-ins, and we couldn't work out exactly why. We honestly were being young parents, and we had very little to steal. We took precautions and changed our son's curtains from Winnie the Pooh, and he slept in our room. We were very afraid, and never really felt secure. Then one night, we could hear someone at the window open the window blinds, and there was a face. He then proceeds to start hitting the glass again. We call the police, while I gave a description again. It takes hours, as they then turn up. We were chatting with them in the carport, and the female police officer informs us the light under the house is on. That was strange. I thought to myself, what light under the house? That's a storage area we had put things in there the day before we moved and not gone in there again and certainly had not found or turned on the light. Well, they go and investigate and basically they find a nest of a bed made out of our old moving boxes with some of my underwear and bras as well as a stack of our son's toys and our outgrown clothing. He had been living under the house. The police told us to padlock the door into the storage area and left telling us to keep an eye out for him. The landlord ended up finding out that it might have been the old tenant who had been evicted. It took me maybe another six months to feel safe, even hanging out clothes on the line. That was due to the fact it was right next to that door. And even now, how many years later, I still don't like storage areas and never really feel safe around them. My story takes place 19 years ago. I'm a female and I was 16 at the time. I'm 5 foot 7. I was about 130 pounds and I like to think that I'm strong but I couldn't take on two young men. So it begins with my mother and stepfather who went away on a vacation and leaving my 17 year old sister and I home alone. They did this quite often. My parents were not winning any parenting awards, that's for sure. My sister and I didn't get along either. She was a nasty piece of work. Luckily she decided to go stay at a friend's house while my parents were away. I was nervous about being alone, so I had my boyfriend staying with me. He was a dickhead but I'm glad that he was there with me. One night, Brett and I were at my house, 
and we had just started messing around. That's when I heard a really loud knock at the door. My room was in the basement, but at the landing area between the stairs. You know how some staircases are broken up and there's a turnaround area? That's the landing. There was a window that I could see the stairs that led up to the alcove of our front porch. I could see two people standing there, and just as I was peeking out to see them better, one of them saw me. I remember feeling the breath sucked out of my chest. There were two young men standing on my porch. It was almost midnight, and I had no idea who the hell they were. The guy that saw me let his friend know, and they both looked in the window and asked me to come to the door. My boyfriend had gone upstairs to open the door, and I remember freaking out because I told him not to. He was one of those guys that thought he was Mr. Tough Guy and believed he could fight anyone. He was telling the guys to leave just as I joined him at the door. They saw me and called me by name and asked for me to let them in. Brett told them to screw off. One guy, I think he said his name was Wes or Les, something like that, said, come outside, we just want to talk to you. They said that to my boyfriend Brett. I said, no thanks, we're going to bed, and shut the door. I was really confused and getting very frightened. They stood on my doorstep for a few minutes and then started knocking again. Wes, slash, bless, explained to me, through the door, that it was my sister's friend and that she had told them I was alone at home and that they should come by. I knew my sister and I believed them. That did not, however, make me stupid. I told them to leave. They started kicking the door. It was shaking, and I seriously feared that it would not hold up. I was so scared that I ran into my kitchen to call the police. I was assured that they would be there very soon, and to lock the doors and stay on the phone. Meanwhile, Brett was still yelling at them, which only served to piss these guys off even more. I begged him to shut up, but he would not listen to me. I was locking all the doors and windows upstairs while Brett went down to check the doors. Down in the basement, there was a huge mudroom area, and it had a thick wooden door made of two by four planks, kind of like a barn door. The door had a big old lock on it, some spring-loaded turnbolt, and also had a plank to set across it, sort of like a barricade. One of the guys was pounding on this door, and Brett heard him tell the other to go try the back door. The stupid door was one of those 1960s things that had a happy little square window right at face level with a little curtain across it. I was at this door, trying to jam a chair under the flimsy knob. That's when I looked up and saw the unnamed guy just looking in at me. I screamed and the dispatcher asked me if I was okay. I barely squeaked out that one of the guys was looking right at me through the window. He was older than me probably about 20, and he was tall, and he looked scary as all hell. His dark eyes were drilling into me, and he wore this creepy, placid smile on his face. I had never seen this man before, but somehow he knew my name. He tapped on the window with one finger, never breaking eye contact, and said, Becky, let me in. I couldn't breathe. The knob was rattling as he was messing with it. He said again, let me in, Becky. I just want to see if you're okay. I just want to talk. He stared at me. I didn't say anything. I was just three feet from him, with my back pressed to the fridge, when he suddenly started beating on the door and screamed, Let me in this house. If I have to break in, I will kill you both, so just open the door. He looked maniacal. Then there was a loud knock at the front door. And then the man went silent. He gave me the most hateful sneer I'd ever seen. I heard shouting, and he ran down the back stairs and into the woods along the back of my yard. Brett had gone to the door. It was the cops. There were two female officers at the front door, and one was just starting to raise her voice, asking where I was when I came to the door. I was so relieved, I started sobbing. I told them they had run away through the woods. Luckily, the woods were not deep. They actually ran along the bank of a large river and there was a bridge just up from where the woods met the road. One officer ran around the back 
while one stayed to get a description and take my statement. Officer number one came back and spoke to officer number two. She said she saw them running across the bridge. They then both left in a hurry, hopped in the cruiser, and sped off. I myself was still crying and shaking, but I was absolutely furious at Brett for riling them up. Well, I went to make myself some tea, thinking of all the ways I could kill my sister when she got home. I had so much anger, fear, and adrenaline pumping through me, I could have ripped her to shreds at that moment. Twenty minutes later, the cruiser came back. There were two guys sitting in the back seat, and the officers wanted me to confirm it was the right guys. I looked through the window and saw them. They still looked terrifying to me. They were in cuffs and could not get to me, but I would not get close to them. Neither of them would look at me, but I did confirm it was them, and we spoke a bit. I told the cops about my sister, suggesting that these two men should come see me. Officer number two kind of mumbled, what a bitch, I had to agree. I pressed charges for attempted forcible entry, property damage, they had broken a window in the living room, trespassing, disorderly conduct, and attempted assault. Initially they both pleaded not guilty, but later admitted to some of the charges. They both got 18 months in jail and were forbidden to contact me or my boyfriend ever again, and to be at least 500 meters from me at all times. I never heard from them ever again. Needless to say, I confronted my sister about it, and of course she denied it, and then laughed about it. She laughed at me. She was an awful person. Now I have no idea what their true intentions were, as they maintained that they were just there to talk to me, but I'm thankful I didn't have to find out. So, too strange to me guys who just wanted to talk at midnight. Well, let's not meet. This happened years ago, when I was 19 years old. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living 600 plus miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week, and we were still really close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive, and I had a 10 year old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up, but still got me from point A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up, so they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every two to three hours and stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within the three hour window though, they would assume I'd been in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audiobook slash podcast they know I would have on, but I accepted the deal. So that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45 AM. This was actually one of the nicer stops, well lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them. The payphone was also not broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple of cars there with people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Miss, can I ask you a favor? I turned around, and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast, as I didn't see him when I parked. But there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked like in his 40s. He didn't look dirty or twitchy, but he was too close. His body language didn't scream, threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 foot, and at that point in my life, 110 pounds, soaking wet. And even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media, I knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night with an out-of-state license plate, my dumbass asked what he needs. 
He told me that he accidentally locked his keys, as well as his phone, in his truck, and could he just borrow my phone real quick to call his friend. It will just take a second, and it would really help me out. I almost handed him my phone. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him. No problem. And then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit, and this guy looked really normal, except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney actress in a Glade commercial who is trying to convince us she's in love with a dumbass who doesn't know how air freshener works eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling, I guess you could call it. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help, so I put my best customer service smile on and I told him, oh my god, I'm so sorry but I don't have a charger and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone and I need that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now, but good luck anyway. I then turned and walked about 20 feet away, and he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me. Now I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my vehicle, because it creeped me out, and he has a serial killer face. So going to the bathroom is out of question, but I also wanted to get away from him, prove I'm not going to help, and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get into my car, but I would have to get really close to him unless I crawled over my passenger side seat and he's not moving. So I did the first thing that popped into my mind. I called my dad and my dad, for the first time that night, didn't pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He's still just staring at me. So I faked a phone conversation with my father I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I had hung up the phone and loudly said that I should be home in about 30 minutes, when in reality I was still at least 4 hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple of visible security cameras. The guy still hadn't moved and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I thought of all the things that I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad, but in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out, and my mind went blank. So I hung up, and I didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning against my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I then walked around a little bit. At this point, He's been leaning against my car, staring at me, for at least 10 minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men sleeping in the parked cars and asking them for help. But just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me get into my own car really annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and headed back to my vehicle. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend that he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car door before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here, unless he can call a friend to bring him the spare key. He's not angry or begging. His voice, however, sounds weirdly friendly, but he'd been creepingly watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I wasn't falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone, just in case I'm wrong about this and I was being a bitch to a guy who needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in, and I lost all nerve, and slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse, and then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on, I was just so focused on getting away from him. And then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me, my mom would freak out if I didn't pick up. I also needed to put my seatbelt on, but I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I was parked, 
with his back toward me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone, but I kept my engine running and I kept watching him. I don't want my mom to worry, so I told her that everything is fine, where I am, and my ETA. Now that I was in my locked car away from him, I was beginning to feel like I had overreacted. She scolds me about speeding, and I tune her out because the guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck, unlock the door, and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seemed to be an issue for him. I now watch the truck head back out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I did have to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes, and when I did, I didn't speed. I didn't want to see that truck. I found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking, and that girls who look like they don't live nearby, or maybe like they are living out of their cars, tend to be the targets. I don't know if that was what was happening, or if he was just trying to scare me into handing over my phone. But either way, creepy guy at the rest stop. Let's not meet. Hello all. I would like to share something that occurred to me many years ago now. My mates don't believe this happened, and I have recounted it many times. I can assure all who read this that it did 100% happen, unfortunately. Back in 1995, at the tender age of 16 years old, I was training to join the British Army. This basically involved a 5 mile run, which I did every day, bar for Wednesday. My run used to take me from my house in Falmouth Cornwall, which happened to be on a steep hill. Our back garden was right next to a well-kept graveyard, which led to the downhill route right onto the seafront. To start the run, I used a tree to jump over the four foot high wooden fence right into the graveyard as a shortcut and then start my run. While taking my runs, I would usually head out between 11pm to 1am. I love the fact that the seafront was usually very peaceful and it's a very pleasant run. Normally nobody else would be around until this night in particular. On this run, I remember the weather was horrendous, the rain was incredibly powerful and blowing in horizontally across the sea with very powerful gale winds and the run was hard going. At around the halfway mark, I came across a strange sight, a man pushing a lawnmower in the middle of the road at around 12.30pm. This weather doesn't sound oddly normal, but it struck me as odd. This has nothing to do with what happened, but it was just an odd thing at night all around. Putting the strange lawnmower man out of my mind, I started my run back. It was against the wind, and my energy was being sapped rapidly. I made it to the final stretch of my run, an extremely steep hill, which at the time, I used to sprint up to end my run, which I did as usual this night. Upon reaching the top, I stopped to get my breath and I could feel a strange sensation. I could sense myself being watched. I will always remember this moment as it seemed like slow motion. I looked to my left and about 15 feet away stood a large man with a short beard. Shoulders slumped, but he was staring intently right at me. He just stood still in the torrential rain and horrible winds. Looking back, I try to picture what he was wearing, etc. But I can't. I just remember his face, and the overriding fact this guy was just standing still by the road at the time of night, in that kind of weather. Our eyes met. I could tell by his whole demeanor that he wasn't friendly, he had an aggressive look, especially in his eyes, and something inside me told me to run, which I did. The instant I started to run, he started sprinting after me too. I have no idea how, but all of a sudden, I went from being exhausted from my already 5 miles of running, to having what felt like Olympian standard speed and stamina, 
It was like some primal instinct came alive inside of me. No matter what, I could not allow this guy to catch a hold of me. In front of me lay two routes downhill and around back up another steep hill to my front door, which is by far the longest route, or about 50 meters to the right. There was the entrance to the graveyard, which led to the backyard, much closer and flatter, but also had no lighting whatsoever. Still, I decided that would be the best way. The whole way through, I could hear him running after me. I didn't know how close. I didn't dare look back, as the graveyard is pitch black, and I knew if I did, I would trip over a curb or something, but I knew he was close enough for me to hear him. I could feel the panic rising in me as I approached my fence, which I practically vaulted to get over with one hand, which was on the fence top. I cleared it in no time and ran into my house and then proceeded to lock the door. To make matters worse, my room was in a converted utility room, which was right by the back door. So running to my bedroom window, looking out, I could see the man staring over the fence at her house. Luckily, he couldn't see me, but I could see him. My mates and family have said, why didn't I run and alert my mom in the house? But I couldn't dare take my eyes off this mentalist. After what I remember seemed like a good hour, he finally went away. But I couldn't sleep as I stayed by my window all night until morning, fearful he could somehow sense I was awake or asleep and then return. I always wonder what would have happened if he had gotten a hold of me that night. But again, it scared me so much. Years later, I still replay it in my mind every now and then. And I think of what if. As part of my degree, I was doing a placement year in another city a little over a year ago. This was a city where I didn't know anyone, and so I moved into private student halls. The halls were arranged into flats of five, so there were five in-suite bedrooms and then a shared kitchen. The keys were electronic, and so your key would open the door to the building, the door to your flat, and the door to your bedroom. Three of my four flatmates were international students, two girls and guy, none of which particularly spoke good English, and they all kept to themselves a lot. They were perfectly friendly whenever I ran into them, but it was rare that I saw them, and we didn't chat much beyond generic small talk. The fourth flatmate was a really outgoing guy. I saw him a bit more often, and he was chattier, but given that none of the others really socialized, he made friends with people from other flats, and so he wasn't about much either. So this meant I was living in a flat with four strangers, and because they were all students, and I was working an 8-6 to six job, we didn't see much of each other, and we never really talked either. It wasn't an ideal arrangement, but it worked fine. I had friends at work, Sometimes I went out with them, and some good tender fortune meant I had a boyfriend that would come over pretty often, so I was pretty settled. I pretty quickly got into a nice routine in days where I had no evening plans, come home, shower, make food in the kitchen, and then retire to my bedroom for the evening. You always hear stories of dodgy flatmates that steal and or mess with people's rooms when they're out. Even though my flatmates seemed pretty nice and harmless, I'd always lock my bedroom door whenever I went out, but I always figured that there was no point in locking my room if I was in there. But one night I'd gone through my usual routine and then gone to bed reasonably early. At around 5am, I'm awoken by the sound of my bedroom door opening. It takes me a second to wake up and realize what's happening, and then I sit bolt right up. Now this is 5 a.m. in winter, and so my room is pitch black, but the corridor light is on, so all I can see is the silhouette of a man standing halfway between the door and my bed. Hindsight screaming probably should have been the automatic reaction here, but I was so in shock that all I could do was repeat the questions, who are you, why are you here, over and over. 
This probably only lasted for about 30 seconds, but when you're frozen with fear in the middle of the night, 30 seconds becomes so much longer. The guy didn't move or say anything. He just stood there looking at me before finally turning and calmly walking back out of my room. When I was finally able to move, I turned on all the lights. I locked the door and called security. They didn't answer. I left a message and never heard anything back. To this day, I have no idea who the man was or why he was there. If it was one of my flatmates, it could only have been the outgoing guy because he was the only one tall enough to be the man in my room. The thing that still really spooks me out, however, is that if it was a simple mistake and someone got the wrong room, which I've had happen in other places I've stayed in, then surely he'd just apologize and leave as soon as they'd open the door. If he had been there to rob me, then again, surely he'd have panicked when disturbed and ran. But the fact that he just stood there and looked at me still sends chills down my spine. Last year, I was hiking in Shenandoah, Virginia. It was a planned two-day hiking trip, myself and two friends. Late into the first day, one of my friends grew ill and decided to turn back. The second friend joined him, just in case it got worse. They told me to go on, and seeing as I had been looking forward to the trip, I did. As evening approached, I came upon a clearing in the forest, on a table surrounded by tools and several cans of spray paint, was an elaborate dollhouse. It was large, perhaps three feet tall. Its walls and windows were open, as if it had just been built and was drying. That lingering smell of spray paint still hung in the air around it. On the back of the house, a photo had been affixed. It was a family picture, old, perhaps taken in the 1980s. Everyone in the picture looked very uncomfortable, like they didn't want to be taking the picture, or were forced to. Not scared, just very uncomfortable. I left it and continued on so that I might reach my planned campsite by nightfall. The wind had picked up considerably. In the distance, I heard a branch give and fall, crashing to the forest floor, startling me. I found my campsite, but was a bit unnerved by the dollhouse in the middle of nowhere. I realized I didn't want to camp out in the open, where whoever was working on it might stumble upon me. I had a, one of those little one-person tents that stand just tall enough for a person to lay down in. I set it up behind a thick stand of brush, one side blocked off by tall stand of rocks. I was glad for this, because not only was I now hidden, but the rocks effectively blocked the heavy winds, which had now turned cold, as the frigid air then tumbled down from the mountains at night. The sound of the wind turned forest was relaxing, and I think I fell asleep right away. Now, have you ever been awoken by a loud sound, and you're unsure of what it was exactly, but some remnant of it echoes in your mind for a moment after waking up? That's what happened to me sometime later, in the pitch dark. I had the sensation that somebody was near me. I listened intently, trying to hear over the wind. I then heard a man's voice somewhere in the distance, harsh, rapid, then becoming softer. He was too far away for me to discern what he was saying, but close enough that I could hear inflection and cadence. It sounded like a crazy person scolding himself, then his voice becoming softer, answering. As I listened, his voice grew louder and louder until I could hear his clumsy footfalls crashing towards me. He walked by where I was camped, just several feet away from the brush that concealed me. By now my eyes had adapted somewhat to the pale moonlight, but I still couldn't make out anything more than a large, massive shape. He was probably about six foot six, heavily built. He was carrying something along beneath his arm, a rolled up tent, 
I guessed. He was angrily talking about someone's face and how it haunted him. His voice then became childlike, and his conversation with himself turned to the topic of cheese and crackers. The dude was clearly off his rocker. That, or he was high on something really good. After a moment, he continued on, his voice receding until I could no longer hear him. I then slept a little that night afterward. At first light, I booked it back the way I came, back to town. I noted that the dollhouse was not in the clearing when I passed back by. Whoever that stranger in the night was, I am glad we did not meet. This happened years ago when I was barely 14 years old. My middle school and middle school of my best friend at the time organized a trip to Great Britain, London. It's supposed to be a few days looking at London attractions, museums, as well as shops. It was fun, until it wasn't. For the day before we were supposed to leave and go home, we were brought to the streets with some interesting shops. From there we could see Golden Freddy, and we received free time for shopping. And then our teachers and guide had a brilliant idea. They told us after the time for shopping ends, we have to meet at a different street than this. In retrospect, it was like a hundred meters away, but they still shouldn't do that. Most of us have never been in London, and we are barely speaking English. We don't even have a map of the city, and roaming services don't work correctly. 90% of the students got lost. I got lost with my best friend because we went in a completely opposite direction. We were both confused about the directions we were given. We were walking along pavement. My friend was running ahead or staying behind to nervously look around. We didn't look like we were together because we were not interacting with each other. I guess that's why this happened. My friend ran ahead and I stopped to look around. That's when I saw a black car approach me and matched my speed. I started to feel like this is a scene from a movie. It was broad daylight. There were a lot of people around and no one reacted. I was confused and didn't know what is happening. Then from the car stepped outside a man and said, You are nice. Come with me. Then he tried to grab me. The car was still running. So I suppose that somebody was still inside it. I was stunned. I did not believe that this was real. At that moment, my friend ran to me from behind, grabbed me, and then dragged me away. We then ran and tried to lose tail of the man and the car which was following us. After some time, we stopped, and my friend nervously cried shaking me and screaming why I didn't move when the man tried to catch me. I explained my deer in my headlights moment, but luckily, we cooled down and we managed to ask some people for help, and we were found by our teachers. We didn't tell anyone there what happened. We were sure nobody was going to believe us. After that, when we got back, I told my parents and I never went on an organized trip by my school again. My mom considered all of that really unprofessional, as well as irresponsible. I'm a 17 year old high school guy with a weak body. I live in a small town in the Philippines and this town is surrounded by a rice field with a highway going straight across it. I hope you get what I'm saying. Part of my usual weekend routine is going jogging early in the morning, sometime around 5 a.m. My usual jogging route is from my house, somewhere in the middle of town, to a small hill with a wonderful view of the town in the morning. To reach my destination, I would have to jog on the side of the highway. From time to time, a fog that would last an hour would appear in the highway and once you're inside you could only see 10 to 15 feet 
before it all goes white. So one Saturday, I decided to jog. I invited one of my friends, same age as me, to join me since he follows the same route anyway. We left home at 5am and proceeded to the highway. As usual, a thick fog blanketed the highway. The cars that would pass by had their lights on, and there were several one-ways because of road repairs. My country is currently issuing a nationwide widening of all the national roads. As we entered the fog, we decided to jog along the side of the road and passed a couple of roadworks, about a hundred meters long each. All was well at that point, a bit exhausted, but otherwise, fine. We barely encountered anybody else, and usually they're just fellow joggers too. That hill with a view is really famous. Then we came across another road work. It wasn't that far from the hill, and we saw this guy crouch down on the asphalt. He was wearing a dirty orange vest and similar dirty hard hat. We couldn't see his face, but we just decided to ignore it. He looked as if he was fidgeting with something in his hands, so we thought he was just holding a few tools or something. Also, there was nobody there but us, me, my friend, and that guy. The fog was still thick as heck. My friend signaled me to keep a distance from the guy, and so I followed him. When we got closer, we heard him humming a strange tune under his breath, which in itself wasn't that weird, but boy we were wrong. As we got closer and closer to the guy, he started acting erratic. He stopped for a moment as I passed him. Then he started laughing. It wasn't a regular laugh, mind you. It sounded sinister and a little dry. It was really loud too, so it really freaked us out. So we decided to increase our speed at that point, as we thought he was just toying with us. But it didn't stop. He just kept laughing and laughing, and we knew it was beyond a prank. I can't describe his laugh more than I just did, but trust me, he wasn't faking it. We didn't look back. We were speeding up now as we were starting to see the hill. I was gasping for air, but I didn't know what would happen if I stopped. I just forced myself to keep running and running, and my friend did the same. It was probably 50 meters behind us when I decided to look at him. He then had stopped laughing, but now he was just standing straight and was glaring at us. He then called out to us, in my language, in an enraged tone. That's when adrenaline kicked in. I just ran and ran until we reached the hill. In hindsight, I don't know how I was able to push myself that far for so long. When we finally arrived at the top of the hill, we were exhausted. I nearly collapsed on a cement bench and stayed there for another hour. Like a breath of fresh air, my friend laughed in a more comedic manner, and I followed suit. We laughed the whole thing off while waiting for the fog to lift. When it did, we walked home. Now, I hadn't had breakfast yet, so I was pretty hungry. As we passed the road work, we saw the guy, and he was no longer there. The only people there were wearing construction outfits. They were the ones signaling the traffic, but none looked like the man that we saw. As I got home, I told my parents what happened, and they said it was probably just another nut job, which were common in my town. Maybe they stole a construction outfit. So since then, I never went jogging into a fog again. So for reading, and highway guy, let's not meet ever again. I've never really told this story before, at least not completely, but it's something that I still think about from time to time. It kind of haunts me. I used to work as a manager of a fast food place in a rather sketchy part of a medium-sized city. I'd work at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me. There were rumors that the location I ended up getting sent to was going to be shut down, which did end up happening a few years after I finally left. Anyway, 
The point is that the place wasn't being well taken care of. The dining room was dated and old, and the owners were certainly not updating or maintaining the place well. They were just barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements, and sometimes they weren't at all. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4pm to midnight. Between 7pm and 11pm, it was me running the drive through and front counter by myself, and one employee running the kitchen. At 11pm, that other employee would go home, and I was left by myself to tidy up and do the deposit between 11pm and 12pm. This isn't really safe, and I'm not sure it was even entirely legal at the time. This was over a decade ago, so who knows. Just to provide a little context and background here, I'm a girl, but I'm not what you would consider small. I'm six foot, and during this time, I think people would probably say I came across as more than a little stern. I was younger, but I'd already spent years working in fast food, getting treated like crap by customers, and having drinks and food thrown at me. The location I worked at was a swarm with junkies and drunk dealers, and just general scary behavior. All this to say, I didn't get ruffled that easily, and I took a lot of things in stride. However, on this night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. The new guy had probably been working there for no more than a few weeks. I'd worked with him a few weeks before, but never the closing shift, and from the first time I'd met him, I'd always gotten a strange vibe from him, and again, I'm not someone who, at the time, got ruffled easily. Prior to this, I'd worked with a night janitor at the other location who had an Adderall addiction and a rather unpredictable and scary rage problem and some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at a time. And when he did, it was always something about how much he disliked women and me in particular. Not an exaggeration. But this guy, this new dude, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and professed to be a single father. He brought the kid around during the daytime and the kid and his clothing were always really dirty. Like, really dirty. And not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms. The kid was a toddler and I know that toddlers can get into things. But one look at the kid, and I knew that those bruises were not from just a little kid messing around. I never saw the guy behave aggressively towards this kid at all, but I don't know. It was just a feeling, and that feeling translated into other things. I don't know. He was just creepy. Now, it wasn't one thing in particular. It was just a feeling I got when I was around him. He was medium height, stocky young guy. He was totally average in every way, but he just had a vibe about him. He was always friendly, never rude or aggressive, but his eyes were just lifeless for a lack of a better descriptor. Anyway, on this night, I think he might have been called in to cover a shift for someone else. I was in charge of making the schedules most of the time. And I was pretty sure I wouldn't have scheduled him to work a closing with me since I found him so off-putting. The first part of the night was fairly normal. I ran the drive through and the front counter and he ran the kitchen between 8 to 11 p.m. He was talking to me on and off between orders. He was telling me about his ex and how he'd come to be a single father. Apparently the mother of his child had a drug problem. In hindsight, I think a lot of what he said was meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but at the time, I just felt a little bit bad for both of them, especially his kid, who I suspected was being abused. However, 
Despite being seen as stern, I was definitely still young, as well as naive, when it came to manipulative people. He told me that he had moved to the city and immediately had trouble finding work prior to getting the job at the place we worked at. He said he'd been running out of money and was behind on rent, bills, and didn't have any formula for his son. At the time, I think I just empathized with him and said that that sucked. We were both working in fast food, and I thought it was obvious that neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones, minimum wage, and I was barely getting by with three roommates, and only pretty much eating the free meal I was given from the restaurant every day. Anyway, he laid it on thick all night, but I don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble when working the late shift, and I'd gotten used to listening to people who spontaneously talked about their personal problems. I myself had a habit of just listening, not really reciprocating the sharing, and I guess this didn't really go over very well with the new guy. At some point, the new guy said something to the effect of, You don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole story here, and you've got nothing to say? Now, I don't know if it was just that I was coming across as unsympathetic, or more likely, that he was frustrated that I wasn't successfully being manipulated into giving up personal details about myself. As far as I was concerned, he was just somebody that I was working with, and I didn't know him. I didn't really want him to know me, and certainly I wasn't about to start telling him anything that wasn't surface level chit chat. But the guy wasn't really intimidating. Something about his tone was just off. It definitely wasn't a jokey accusation or off-the-cuff comment. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I remember that I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't say anything more about it, but after that silence between us seemed a little tense. At 11pm, it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was that the kitchen closer would tidy their area, and an actual kitchen cleaner would come in a few hours later to do the deep cleaning. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I left. Anyway, this guy was tasked with basic tidy, and then I would let him out, after which I would stay behind to prepare the deposit. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy goes off into the staff bathroom and stays there for a long while, almost like 20 minutes or something. I did not know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle the situation. It had honestly never happened before. People usually could not get out of there fast enough at the end of the night. Was he possibly sick? Did he fall asleep? I didn't know, but... I honestly just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and quickly walked to the door and left, and I was relieved. It was weird, but I just shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done what I needed to get done. But not ten minutes later, I start to hear a banging at the back door of the restaurant. Loud, repeated banging. Normally, I would ignore this. The back door faced an alley and was right next to a street full of bars, as well as pubs. People leaving the bars and pubs often got the idea that if you banged on the door, it would get them after hours food service, because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't unnecessarily uncommon, so I just ignored it and kept hurrying to get things done. But the banging did not stop, and it somehow just seemed to get louder and louder, as well as more urgent. So I finally got up and went to look out the people to see who was there. At this point, I was definitely on the edge, and this edginess swelled into a full-on anxiety attack. That's when I see that it's the new guy standing at the back door. Now, my first thought was not to open the door. I really didn't want to open the door, but I knew that he knew that I was in there. What if he forgot something inside? What if it was his house keys, car keys, or something else? 
I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point, so there really seemed to be no escaping him. So, reluctantly, and very stupidly, yes, trust me, I know, I opened the door. What I opened the door to was, quite frankly, terrifying to me. He said he left his jacket, or his keys maybe, I can't remember, inside, and I told him to tell me where it was, and I'd go get them. I didn't want him to come inside the store. If this had been any other person I worked with regularly, this would be no big deal. I let them back in, let them get whatever they left behind, and they'd take off. But I instinctively knew I didn't want this dude back inside, in the dark, empty restaurant, with me. But new dude was not having it. He pushed past me and said he'd get it himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again, and at this point, I just panicked. Instead of just staying there by the door, which in hindsight, I should have, I rushed back to the office. Stupid girl, that's me, had left some of the cash I was counting for the deposit out. Question, what dummy would answer the back door at night at all, and especially with a till out? Well, this girl, I guess, this dumb girl. I managed to stuff the cash in the safe and lock it before he came to find me. The office was dark, it was summer, and the air conditioning was on full blast, but this dude was sweating a lot. I was taller than him, and I'm not a small girl, but somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I grabbed my jacket hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I was getting out of there. I didn't care how much shit I got in the morning from my work not being done. I smiled, and I told him that I was just leaving, and that he would walk me out. I was really just trying not to show my panic. Whatever he had planned, I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink it. So I smiled, grabbed my purse, and started to move towards the door. New guy, who was standing in the doorway, did not budge. He started talking though, about his son, about the money trouble he had been having, and capped the whole story off with a request for a loan. From the tone of his voice, it was clear, this was not a loan. He was demanding money from me. He said he would pay me back as soon as he got paid, and that I'd really be helping him out. I didn't know what to do now. He had me trapped, and I wasn't leaving the office or the building unless he allowed it. Or at this point, at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me that despite my height difference, I wasn't going to win. So I gave him money from my wallet. Fifty dollars, I think. When I gave it to him, he said, Thanks, you're really helping me and my son out. I won't forget it. But when he said it, he had no expression, no smile, no speech effect at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved. Just dead eyes, arms limp at his sides. It was terrifying. To this day, I don't remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind him, making sure the door was securely locked and rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed in there until I could force myself to leave out the same door. I was sure he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me to call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. He'd asked me for money, and I'd willingly given it to him, despite the fact that I felt I had no choice, and I had been scared shitless. I only saw him one more time after that, but neither of us ever mentioned that night, or the money. I don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think it was embarrassment, or scared, or both. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story, or at least, I definitely left out the part where I gave him money and never got it back. Pretty quickly after that, he stopped showing up to his shifts, and I never saw him again. I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around. I think people overuse psychological terms like that 
making them just synonymous with anyone who is just horribly behaved. And there are a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in this world. That is unfortunate. But after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's effect that was just wrong, for lack of a better term. I'd smile. He'd smile. I'd frown. He'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone pantomiming my emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me. But the truth is that I've never been comfortable talking about this event. And to this day, when I do think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as I did the day it happened. That was more than a decade ago. So to the new guy, let's never meet again. P.S. The head manager at my restaurant did make an anonymous call to child services about the guy's kid. Unrelated to my incident, obviously. I don't know what, if anything, came of that. I'm going to warn you now. This story is a bit long, and it's quite a doozy. So grab some popcorn and perk up those ears. This happened about 6 years ago now. I'm 27 years old currently. Having said that, I apologize if there are small details missing or that I don't remember. I had gotten out of a 3 year relationship that didn't end particularly well. Now I didn't want to be one of those girls that made her way through a friend group if you can catch my drift. So I wanted a change of scenery. Thus, I decided to try my luck on a dating site called OKCupid. I know, I know, terrible idea. I'm well aware of that now, but hindsight is always 2020. In my mind, most of the dating sites are a cesspool of incels, catfish, or desperate people. To my surprise, I actually went on several decent dates. No red flags, creeper vibes, or weird feelings whatsoever. Luckily, I made my mom aware of what I was doing, so whenever I'd go on a date, she'd know where I was and when I was going to be home. Mama didn't raise no idiot, right? Wrong. This is when I came across Dennis's profile. He seemed chill, kinda cute, and somewhat interesting, so I sent him a message. He was playful and had a sarcastic sense of humor right up my alley. I decided to give him a shot. We met at a coffee shop and we had some very engaging and interesting conversation. Dennis was 5 foot 9, normal build, balding with reddish hair and glasses. He definitely gave off some nerd vibes. He started off by asking, what are you looking for? I gave my normal response. I'm wanting someone who is sweet and caring, but also funny and intelligent. Something along those lines. Nothing groundbreaking. Cut me some slack. I was young. I realized later that giving this sort of response was going to be the beginning of the end. Dennis and I went on a couple more dates that were unmemorable. I started to fall head over heels for this guy and fast. He was sweet, understanding, caring, empathetic, worked out, and took care of himself. He was everything I ever wanted in a guy. It was difficult to understand why he was single. Since I was falling for him so quickly, we agreed that we would be exclusive. Everything was going smoothly until about two months into our relationship. That's when shit started to hit the fan. For the last month, I had been pushing him to let me hang out at his place and to meet his roommate from the suggestion of my parents because they're smart people. Every time I push the subject, he'd always make up some excuse on why we can't. My roommate is crazy. It's not a good time for him. He works opposite schedules than me, etc. It was always something. At some point, we had made plans to go out to a club one evening. I was all dressed and ready to go, waiting on him. He ended up not answering his phone for a couple of hours. 
I realized his phone must have died since whenever I would send him a message, it would never say delivered. For those of you who are Apple users, you'll understand. I ended up deciding to go over to his place to see if he would answer his door. I obtained his address at some point. I just don't remember how. Anyway, he lived about 15 minutes from me in an apartment complex and it was the middle of winter, February. It was freaking cold. I knocked on his door. There was no answer. While heading back to my car, look who decided to show up. None other than Dennis himself. And guess who he was with? Yes, you're correct. Another woman. I later found out it was his long-term girlfriend, Jessica. I quickly made my way over to him, and the look on his face was priceless. His face was deadpanned as soon as he saw me. He whispered something to the girl he was with, and she made her way inside. He then came over to me, and was speechless at first. I am very surprised to see you here. Really? We had plans, remember? I wanted to see if you were home. I do remember. My phone died so I didn't receive any of your text messages and I lost track of time. We were at a friend's birthday party. Who's the girl? My roommate. I thought the guy was your roommate. He is. She's my other roommate and a very good friend. Mind you, I'm a very skeptical person and alarm bells were definitely going off in my mind in accordance with my parents' numerous warnings. However, Dennis is the sort of person who is very good at talking himself out of situations. His reasoning behind the decisions he makes, why he made them, etc. He was an excellent liar, and being the naive and insecure person I was, I believed him. We ended up going to the club after I waited for him outside in my car for almost an hour. I didn't think about it too much, since I was getting what I wanted and nothing was said about his girl roommate. Over the next month, I kept pushing Dennis to meet his family and his guy roommate. He eventually caved and brought me to see his mother. It was an extremely odd experience. We talked about books and some of Dennis's friends, and I made some snide remark about how Dennis's guy roommate was nuts. Dennis's words, not mine, and they both gave me the strangest glances. This would make more sense to me in about a month or so. Eventually, I started to realize that Dennis's stories weren't adding up, and I started to see holes in his stories. He would only see me on Tuesday and Thursday evenings because he worked a lot of overtime. He would never be flexible or change his mind, or even allow me to attempt to change his mind if he was late coming to see me, which started to happen pretty frequently. He would send me screenshots of his work and his work vehicle in line for getting a wash, or he would send me screenshots of his bathroom saying he just wanted to freshen up. When I would ask for a picture of him in that moment of him in his bathroom mirror, he would decline. He refused to send any pictures of himself, proving that he was where he claimed to be. He would also take unusually long bathroom breaks in my house after sex. I'm saying like 20 or more minute long breaks. I know, another huge alarm bell. Everything came to a head about a month or so later. I told Dennis that I wanted us to go somewhere with no phone service so that we could truly spend time together without technology being a distraction, and he agreed. We ended up making plans to spend two to three days in Canada. It was still early in our relationship four months, and my mom wanted to make sure I was safe, so she took down Dennis's driver's license and made a copy of it, as well as his license plate. Thank you, mom. The trip ended up relatively uneventful, until the last evening in the hotel room. I'm not sure if it was on purpose, or if he was actually asleep. Dennis ended up rolling over to my side, pulling me in close, and saying, I love you, Jessica. That made my blood run cold. I was so upset. Tears started to blur my vision as I got up out of bed. My parents were right all along. He was a liar, 
and a cheat. Did I break it off? No, of course not. That would make sense. Why? I was naive and desperately in love with him. I also didn't want to admit it to myself that I had been played or that I was this side chick. So I acted as if nothing was wrong and that I didn't hear what he said that night. Of course, it didn't get rid of the aching feeling that I had for several weeks. I began to have bad anxiety and panic attacks on my way to school because of that bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Dennis was constantly lying to me, and I mean constant. It was so bad that I ended up starting to feel angry. I let that feeling simmer for a couple of days until I decided to do something about it. When realizing that you were right all along and things weren't just a strange coincidence, it's very bittersweet. On a freezing March day, after an exhausting day at school, I wanted to get rid of the nagging feeling in the back of my mind once and for all. So I decided to head over to Dennis's apartment complex to see if he was still lying to me about living in the apartments with his girl roommate. I got out of my car and the parking. I was shaking. I didn't know if it was from anxiety or from anger that was starting to bubble below the surface. Was he lying about his girl roommate? Well, you bet your sweet ass he was. I knocked on his door and hid myself from the view of their people. He answered the door with his girl roommate behind him. I came from around the corner to look at him with an emotionless face and say, Wow. I turned on my heels and walked away, only to find out as I get back to my car that I locked myself out of my vehicle on a cold March day in the middle of winter. I was so distracted by my rage and sadness that I didn't realize I left both my keys and phone and car. I'm such an idiot. I was besides myself. I didn't know what to do. I locked my phone in the car along with my keys. How the hell can you do that? I was so angry at myself for being a moron. Not only that, I was in the parking lot of my cheating ex-boyfriend's apartment complex. I wish I was making this up. I really do. Well, with nothing else to lose, Literally, I walked back to Dennis's apartment and knocked on their door. Jessica answers and I beg to use their phone to call AAA. Jessica, surprisingly, agrees and lets me use her phone. This entire time, Dennis is agitated and kept walking around after I got off the phone with AAA. At one point, he even went outside with a coat hanger in an attempt to unlock my car but to no avail. During that time, I took advantage of me being alone with Jessica so I could get some information out about her. Like, how long have they been together? Where did they meet? I felt as though I was an auctioneer. I was shooting 20 questions at a rapid fire before Dennis came back in. By the end of it, it had been more than enough information to prove that Dennis was not who he said he was. Everything started to make sense and puzzle pieces began connecting. One of the biggest aha moments for me was when we both were talking about being in a relationship with him on Facebook. It turns out that this sly dude created two different Facebook accounts so he can ensure he was in a relationship with both of us on each of them only to block the other girl on that account, guaranteeing that neither of us would come across each other or his other Facebook account. I remember in the beginning, I commented on how his Facebook profile was super limited and didn't have anything on it. He claimed it was only because he used Facebook to befriend co-workers on it and didn't use it that much. Anyway, near the end of our conversation, I tried convincing Jessica that Dennis was a pathological liar and didn't care about her. It was at this point, I realized that Jessica could have been aware of everything that Dennis was doing and was in on it, or she was just that naive. I tried texting her after I left their apartment to try and talk some more sense into her, but it was useless. Dennis was with her alone and was a master at skewing and spinning stories. Unfortunately for him, I had one more trick up my sleeve. 
Over the course of the next week, I spent my remaining few free hours I had, if I wasn't studying or working, gathering evidence against Dennis. I did research on Dennis and Jessica through Google, but mostly Facebook. This is the scary part about Facebook if you don't have your privacy settings on lock. I found out who Jessica's parents were and decided to send them a message through Facebook with all the evidence I'd collected over the past week and a half against Dennis, ensuring that they would believe me and my story. When I say evidence, I mean photos of him and I, screenshots of conversations we had through text messages, pictures of him and I, etc. All of these pictures, text messages, conversations having timestamps to show that he was seeing me at the same time he was seeing Jessica. I was hoping they wouldn't write me off as some crazy ex-girlfriend or some psycho. Wishful thinking, am I right? The message is long, so... Grab your second bucket of popcorn. I have copied it verbatim from the original post that I sent several years ago. I have changed some information to protect my privacy and the privacy of others. Hello, insert Jessica's mom's name. My name is X, and I thought there was something you should know. Your daughter is being lied to by her current boyfriend, Dennis. I met him on an online dating site. Okay, Cupid, and we spent the last five months together, but Dennis ended up lying to me about his life and everything about it. I doubt your daughter knows the extent to which she had been lied to. I feel it is only right for me to share the information I have collected with you so that it may be brought to your daughter's attention and so he can no longer get away with this type of behavior. Dennis is not who he says he is or appears to be and he has lied about many aspects of his life. Let me explain. Note, for most of the information I give you today, I also have pictures as evidence, and for your convenience, to back up what I have to say. I will mention each time when a picture can be paired with information provided. First and foremost, a breakdown of the dentist that I learned about while dating him for five months. Full name, Dennis. Middle name, Last name, phone number, address, Dennis's mother's address, workplace. It includes details of his work schedule, as well as him working at alternate weekends. Exact vehicle description with disguising features. Two distinguishing decals on the back window. Picture provided, license plate number. As stated previously, I met Dennis on OKCupid, an online dating site in early November. His online name was X, picture provided, which is also the same online name he used for Flickr. We dated for five months until I found out he had lied to me about his living conditions and the fact that he also had another girlfriend, your daughter. I have several pictures showing that Dennis and I were together as a couple. He also has several Facebook accounts, picture provided. One he called a work Facebook in which he was in a relationship with me and another account in which he was in a relationship with your daughter. His work Facebook account no longer exists since he deleted it, but I was able to take pictures of it before it was deleted to prove what I'm saying. Now before continuing, I should mention that I have met your daughter twice. The first time was very brief and Dennis told me that she was only a good friend they had just gotten back from hanging out with friend's name at Dave and Buster's for his birthday. Pictures provided. This was back in early January. The second time meeting her was for a longer period of time. This was at the beginning of March. I ended up going to Dennis's apartment to see if he was lying to me about still living at the apartments. He was. I ended up knocking on their door to find Dennis answering it and to see your daughter standing behind him. Jessica mentioned to me about how she and Dennis had been dating for almost four years. I was also made aware of another Jessica. Her name is Jessica W. He dated not too long before he started dating me. Pictures provided. And Jessica has also sent me texts mentioning that there may be a possibility of him seeing other women aside from your daughter and Jessica. A different Jessica. Pictures provided. 
I will attach separate files with all the photos I have collected. They will be in the order in which they are mentioned in this letter to you. I hope this information is of use to you, and I hope I was able to help in proving that Dennis is not who he says he is, and for you not to be fooled like I was. Thank you very much for your time. Sincerely, X. I did end up receiving a reply from her mother the following morning. However, this post is already long enough, and I will post the responses if anyone is interested. The last time I heard from Dennis was a message he decided to leave in the grass in my backyard. It was a dead rabbit with its head cleanly cut off from its body. It was clear a human did it since there was no sign of blood and the head was cleanly cut off. My family and I reported it to the police in case any escalation happened. Luckily, nothing did. Now, unfortunately, Dennis was smart enough not to take it any further, but it was clear. He was angry. He didn't want to leave any sort of trail, whether it be through internet or paper, implying that he did it. Anyway, if you've stuck around this long, I thank you for your time. This took quite a while for me to write, since there was way more drama than what I have mentioned above, and I have no desire to relive this experience again. My method of madness is to get my story out there, so that anyone reading or listening can know that your feelings are valid and to listen to your gut. Ladies and gentlemen, please be mindful and careful of who you become close with. The stories you hear on TV about people living two separate lives, or this wasn't the person I knew, are very much real, and they exist right under your nose. And to Dennis, screw you and your empty apology. I feel sorry that Jessica had to deal with your dumbass as long as she did. You're only sad that you got caught. And to be honest with all of you, I hope karma plants him on his ass. To all ladies he has messed with, I hope you're okay and that he hasn't dashed too much of your confidence. He's a lowlife and that's all he'll ever be. Anyway, thanks for listening. Take care friends and please be very careful. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode so far. Wrapping up today's episode is Miss Creepy Tales with the final scary story. Take it away. I've known about the subreddit for a while now, but I have never gotten around to telling my own story, which of course, I never thought I'd have. And since it's long, I won't bother with a long intro. This is all you need to know. This happened in my senior year of college, and I lived off campus. I had two roommates in my apartment or townhouse and they were named Natalie and Katie. Anyway, Katie was out that night doing homework in one of the school buildings, and I was awoken at 3 a.m. when I heard some knocking at the door downstairs. I thought that was weird, considering the hour, but I figured that somebody had the wrong place and then would realize it and then leave. But the knocking didn't stop though, and I lied in bed for a good several minutes, thinking, Yeah, they'll go away now. They'll go away and they'll get bored. As one might expect though, I started to grow confused and then kind of freaked out by this person's persistence. Then, the knocking turned into banging and I couldn't ignore it anymore. Honestly, I probably should have called the police instantly, but it was the middle of the night and I was just confused. So I headed to the top of the stairs to see Natalie standing near the door staring at it. Her room was on the bottom floor, so she had just walked up to it. We exchanged the baffled look because what the heck, it's 3 a.m., and this is weird. Natalie called out and asked him who they were and what they wanted. We're friends of Katie's, said the voice on the other end. 
who sounded male and about our age. We know her boyfriend and we heard she was feeling down, so we came to surprise her. That was already a weird story, because again, three in the morning. But thankfully, Katie wasn't even home, so we both informed them of this. We said that Katie's not here and she's off doing something else. Good, they know now, so they're going to leave, right? They came here to see Katie, and she's not here, so they will leave us alone, and then we can go back to sleep. Just open the door. I know, I know. If I hadn't called the police before, I definitely should have done it now. It was weird, though. That night, I realized why people do stupid stuff in horror films. Not only had I been woken up out of nowhere, but it feels surreal to be in a situation like this one. Like, there's no way you could actually be in danger. That only happens in horror movies and true crime documentaries and in questionable creepy stories online. It would never happen to me. I'm just a random, ordinary boring person going about my business. I don't need to call the police, and I'm sure that this will get cleared up and everything will be fine. So yeah, Natalie and I did the stupid thing and then tried to argue with them. We told them again that Katie wasn't here, so there was no need for them to stay. Eventually, Natalie asked what their names were. Throughout the encounter, we made out two distinct voices, but only one gave us a name. And I texted Katie without telling him, asking if she was friends with someone with that name. And after a couple of minutes, during which we were still arguing with a stranger, Katie replied, I am, but I don't think she knows where I live. That wasn't good, but even worse, she... The person on the other door had a male voice, so this was a real name, but not the real person. Whoever this was knew stuff about Katie, like who she hung out with. I told Katie to stay where she was and not come back until we told her everything was okay. And finally, we told the guys that if they didn't leave, we were going to call the police. No, 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 no. Don't call the police. Don't call the police, okay? If we wanted to do something bad, we already would have done it, right? Yeah, that last bit wasn't helping their case. And then they added, Just open the door, okay? The attempts at reasoning with them basically devolved into them just telling us, just open the door. Come on, just open the door. Over and over again, until we finally did call the police. We hid in Natalie's room and then dialed 911 and explained what was going on. Thankfully, there was a police station close by, so it wouldn't take long for them to arrive. Unfortunately, I made the mistake of heading back into the living room and yelling through the door that we call the cops, but contrary to what you might think, that actually didn't seem to scare them at all. They seemed only mildly upset and then kept arguing. And to this day, I can only assume that they just didn't believe us or something. And then we heard a neighboring home store swing open and a very pissed off man's voice say, If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the police. And for whatever reason, that was what caused them to freak out, and then they drove off. The police arrive, and we told them the whole story. Natalie revealed that a couple of times, she had just barely peeked through the blinds of a window close to our front door, and she noted 
that there were two guys, but only one of them was ever at the door at any given time. They would switch, with one at the door and the other sitting in the driver's seat of the car parked out front, presumably for getaway purposes. So, yeah, that's reassuring. They also hadn't looked drunk, according to Natalie, and they definitely didn't sound like they were drunk. There wasn't much the police could do besides sweep the area a bit, but they told us that if the stranger showed up again, to immediately call instead of engaging with them at all. One of the officers did give us some self-defense tactics and told us what kinds of household items or chemicals would work best for self-defense. And after making sure that everything was okay and reassuring us, they left, and we eventually called Katie and then told her that the weirdos were gone. She arrived and was understandably a bit shaken herself. We sat down and asked her who might have known where she lived. She did know people who had come to the apartment, so some people certainly, but Natalie hadn't recognized the guys outside as any previous visitors. Worse, it turned out that not only did they know Katie's friend's name, but they claimed to know her boyfriend even though he didn't even live in the state that we were going to school. She swore up and down that she didn't know anyone who would want to hurt her. And by this point, it was around 5 a.m., so I didn't even bother going to sleep since I was going to a workshop that morning. I told a lot of my classmates the story, and it freaked them out too. And the entire day, Natalie and I jumped at every unexpected noise, every shadow, every random movement. And that night, it was hard to sleep. I expected to hear knocking at the door at any second. Thankfully, they didn't come back, ever. But that makes things more unsettling. In a way, I will never ever know what they wanted that night. Did they think we were hiding Katie? Was she seeing less than savory people in secret? Did they want to hurt her? If they did, why did they never give up and go looking for her elsewhere? Or was all of that just an excuse to get into an apartment of young women? Did they want to kidnap us, hurt us, maybe rob us? Who knows? I try not to let it bother me but I wish I knew if my life was in danger that night. I have the feeling that it might have been. After all, they weren't wearing face coverings, so if they wanted to commit a violent crime, they might want to get rid of witnesses. But despite how much I wish I knew... So yeah, random strange men who insisted that we let them inside for unknown reasons... Let's not meet. Hey there everyone, thanks for watching today's video. If you enjoyed, make sure to leave a like and make sure to leave a comment telling me what you thought. Also, if this is the first time you're joining us on the Creepy Fox Podcast, make sure to subscribe and turn on that notification bell. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads that are coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to get yourself some Creepy Fox merch, then check right below the video. There's shirts, stickers, sweaters, coffee mugs, you name it. Go ahead and check it out. Also, if you'd like to go ahead and support the channel too, you can consider becoming a channel member. Channel members get early access to brand new uploads, as well as exclusive videos that aren't available to anyone else. Now with that said, I would like to go ahead and give a thank you to the channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Corey, Jen, and Sylvia. Thank you also to the regular viewers who watch the channel, leave likes, comments, and share the channel with their family and friends. Now with that said, 
I'll go ahead and see you all in the next episode of the Creepy Fox YouTube Podcast. Until then, take care and have yourself an amazing day.